So my name is uh, Nicola Longo. I'm a, a professor of pediatrics at the University of Utah in Salt Lake City. And I became interested in disorder of creatine metabolism around 2002, 2003, when I started having my first patient with uh, GAMT deficiency. And uh, my area of expertise is the measurement of membrane transport, and that it is what I will discuss today. And the main focus would be to determine whether creatine and cyclocreatine get inside the cell using the same of or different mechanism. Why? Cyclocreatine is a creatine analog, which is it looks like creatine, but was believed to enter inside the cell using a separate mechanism. And there were initial studies in animal models that are listed here. You, I, know, I don't think you can read them, but you know, those are the studies that were done in animal models of creatine transporter deficiency, showing that therapy with cyclocreatine improve the performance of the animal model. And that it is why they wanted to transfer this medicine to the treatment of patients with creatine transporter deficiency. Now, how does creatine enter inside the cell? Creatine is soluble in water, but all cells are surrounded by membrane that are composed of lipid, fats. Fats do not mix with water, so there are specific membrane transporters that allow the entry of creatine and any other water-soluble compound inside the cell. And what we do, we group all of these transporters into family. And the family to which the creatine transporter belongs is SLC6. Now there are 30, 40, 50, almost 100 families of membrane transporter. This is just one of 100 families, so there are an expanding number. And each family contains multiple members. So this is member number eight of the family SLC6. The way that membrane transporter work is that they allow the entry of a chemical. And you can see how a membrane transporter looks like. It, they punch a hole inside the membrane. And they allow the entry, in this case, of two sodium ion, one chloride ion, together with creatine. And it is the fact that you uh, use the electrochemical gradient of sodium that allows the accumulation of creatine inside the cell. Now, there are many other membrane transporters that look like the one of creatine. Again, this is part of a family, and the SL66 family includes the transporter for creatine, which is most similar to what uh, are transporter for GABA. Gamma amino butyric acid is a, a neurotransmitter a chemical that allows the cell to basically relax a little bit. But there are also other transporters that carry uh, uh, norepinephrine, dopamine, chemicals that stimulate the contraction of the cell. There are also amino acid transporters. Amino acids are the basic component of uh, our body. Now, why is this important? It is important because obviously what you might have is that these transporters are very specific, but at the same time, if you have a very high concentration of something else, they might be able to bring it in. So you may use some of these transporters to allow the entry of creatine inside the cell. So what happens if we measure creatine transport 
in fibroblast from patients with creatine transporter deficiency. So this is the transport that you see in cell that do not have trans creatine transporter deficiency. And you can see the marked reduction in creatine transport in cell of patients with creatine transporter deficiency. Now the first question, is cyclocreatine capable of entering the cell that cannot transport creatine? And the answer is no. So here you have two panels. On the top you see the transport of creatine by normal cell and cell from a patient with creatine transporter deficiency. And you can see that there is a big difference between the two. The same identical difference is seen by cyclocreatine. Now, people were seeing some effect of cyclocreatine in animal. One question we ask is, maybe that creatine, cyclocreatine goes inside, but stays inside longer in cells that are missing the creatine transporter. So in other words, the efflux might be less. So we study how cyclocreatine and creatine get out of the cell. And again, we saw absolutely no difference. Cyclocreatine seems to get inside the cell using the same identical transporter that transports creatine. Now, uh, why does creatine uh, stay inside the cell? So what you can see here is that it goes out of the cell, but you know, it remains most of it inside. Why does it stay inside? The reason is that number one, once creatine and cyclocreatine are inside the cell, they become phosphorylated. They have a chemical change that makes them different. And that chemical change keeps them inside the cell. The second thing that happens is that there is a constant gradient of sodium from the outside of the cell to the inside of the cell that keeps them uh, basically inside the cell. But again, if you are missing the creatine transporter, you do not transport creatine, you do not transport cyclocreatine. Now, we define the transporter by some uh, chemical measure that define how they have affinity toward a given compound, in this case, creatine and cyclocreatine. So the creatine transporter has a high affinity toward creatine. And we define that using one parameter, which is called Km. A Km is the, usually the concentration of substrate at which you obtain half maximal activity of the transporter in this case. The lower the Km, the highest the affinity. So and the affinity is about 10 micromolar. Just for a context, the normal concentration of creatine in blood is about between 30 and 150 micromolar with an average of about 80 to 100. That it is what it is. So basically what that means is that in physiological condition, this membrane transporter works 100%. Cyclocreatine seems to have a lower affinity and depending on the method that you use for the computation is between 40 and 60 micromolar. So it is about six times less, less uh, specific for cyclocreatine as compared to creatine. But again, it seems exactly the same identical transporter. Now, what can we do to confirm this? So first of all, we can look whether the transport of creatine and cyclocreatine is inhibited by the same compound. And the second thing, we can see whether creatine and cyclocreatine can enter the cell using different transporters. How do we do that? So basically, we try to determine what membrane transporter can be utilized by the cell to get 
creatine cyclocreatine inside. And many people in our field, I mean, they think that you know, sometimes uh, chemical diffuse inside the cell. In reality, that it is a phenomenon that in physiological condition does not occur. But what happened is that, as I told you at the beginning, that there are hundreds, thousands of transporters. What can happen is that creatine might use a different transporter to get inside the cell. And again, the way that we do, we use different type of inhibitor, in this case, many amino acids, guanidino compound, guanidino acetate, to inhibit the transport of creatine. And what we find is that there are some of the amino acids that we use that are very strong, relatively good inhibitor of the creatine transporter. And they are listed here. These are just simple amino acids that, again, they are part of our diet. They are part of the protein that we eat. And uh, what these have in common is that they seem to be substrate of a spe another membrane transporter, which is called SLC35A5, which is the transporter for histidine. Now, what happens is that normally these transporters transport histidine, but when you put creatine at very high concentration, that might be able to enter the cell using this transporter. And in fact, when you look at the inhibition of histidine transport by cyclocreatine and creatine, you see a high degree of inhibition. This is in patient cell. What this means that in theory, if we had a very high level of expression of alternative transporter, one could use them to allow the entry of creatine into the brain. But again, this, uh, I, we do not know if this would be physiologically possible. Now, what we have seen is that creatine and cyclocreatine use the same transporter, which is the one encoded by the SLC6A8 gene, to enter human cells that neither creatine nor cyclocreatine can enter human cell when SLC6A8 is defective. I mean, the cyclocreatine, from what we see in the lab, should not have any advantage over creatine in treating creatine transporter deficiency. The other thing that we see that other membrane transporters, such as the, uh, what is called a system N member five, which is the SLC36A8, could theoretically be used, if expressed at very high level, to allow the entry of creatine inside the brain when the creatine transporter is missing. So, and this actually also corroborate a result in animal study because subsequent animal studies have shown that actually cyclocreatine not, uh, can have severe toxic effect in animal, both in normal animals and animal models of creatine transporter deficiency. So there have been studies in uh, mice uh, where they found the presence of little changes in brain cell exposed f uh, when mice were exposed for long term to cyclocreatine. Rats develop seizure, and in the in beagle dogs, the lungs, kidney, heart, skeletal, and, uh, and smooth muscle were the target organ of uh, uh, cyclocreatine toxicity. What that means is that cyclocreatine it would not be useful to use in creatine transporter deficiency. I would have, la I mean, I would have hoped that that were not the case, but that's what both animal and in vitro study are finding. I want to thank all of the members of my laboratory and especially Dr. Marta Frigini, who has been working on this project for a long time. Thank you for your attention. Yes. Thank you for your very impressive talk. 
just one question. Uh, uh, oh, sorry, you need to speak on the microphone. Otherwise, they cannot translate you. <laughs> I understand English, but some people don't. Thank you, Dr. Longos. Um, thank you for your very impressive talk. Um, will you just uh, comment on the potential uh, reconversion of phosphocyclocreatine into cyclocreatine? So the question is if I can comment on the conversion of a, a, a cyclophosphocreatine to cyclocreatine. So we actually studied what happened to cyclocreatine what it goes inside the cell. And uh, uh, cyclocreatine is very rapidly converted to, cyclo, uh, to uh, cyclophosphocreatine, but the, uh, the, uh, the ratio between cyclophosphocreatine and uh, uh, cyclocreatine is the same as the ratio of creatine to phosphocreatine. So it doesn't uh, behave any differently than, than creatine. So what I do not know is how efficient is the transfer of the phosphorus group to ADP from cyclophosphocreatine as compared to uh, phosphocreatine. That I do not know. Thank you. So, uh, sorry, to explain the question better is that the mechanism by which creatine works is that it accumulates a very high energy uh, bond with phosphorus. And the, the mechanism of action is that uh, phosphocreatine can transfer the phosphorus to the molecule that the cell use for normal reaction, which is called ADP. Now, can cyclophosphocreatine do the same? We do not know. I mean, it can do some of it, but probably not as well as creatine. Thank you for, uh, for your interesting talk and um, also a little bit for the set data. Um, I was wondering, do you consider cyclocreatine still of interest to study or basically because of the toxicity that you have mentioned, um, we should leave this field and go for other transporters or other mechanisms to get creatine for patients with a transporter defect? Yeah. Now, I consider cyclocreatine was initially studied as an anti-metabolite for therapy in cancer. And I think that that's where it should be studied, not for the treatment of creatine transporter deficiency. I'm very sorry. I would have loved it, but no. Thank you, Dr. Longo. For the second part of your presentation, you discussed creatine getting into cells through different transporters. Um, do you have any indication of why that happens, whether the, the amino acid that is associated with the transporter is escorting creatine with it? So the question is, how does creatine enter the cell using a different membrane transporter? It does not get inside together with the amino acid. It competes with that amino acid simply because the chemical structure of creatine is similar to the chemical structure of the amino acid. So in physiological condition, the transporter will transport mostly the physiological substrate, in this case histidine, inside the cell, unfortunately. You would have to reach concentration in blood of several millimolar, which is about 40, 50 times what you get normally of creatine to get significant in, uh, entry of creatine using this other less specific transporter. Um, so two follow-up questions. One, 
Do you think that inhibiting the amount of histamine in the body would affect the amount of creatine needed? And what do you think the next steps would be in studying this more? The next step would be to find another compound which is not toxic that could substitute a little bit the function of creatine. Or a creatine prodrug, meaning something that uh, once it gets inside neuronal cell is transformed into creatine and does not require uh, but, uh, the creatine transporter. So let's say that you modify creatine to be transported well by one of these other transporters. It can get inside the cell. It can work. But at the same time, it needs to be modified in a way that uh, uh, it can use those transporters. That's what one needs to do. So one needs to do some type of chemistry that allows to generate a molecule that can be split once it is inside the cell into creatine. Those are the two mechanisms, either finding an alternative metabolite that can bind phosphorus and transfer that to ATP. I, I, but you know, in nature, we do not know of many that are like that. Or finding a prodrug that gets inside the cell and that gets transformed into creatine. Thank you.